When I was a kid, about the time I was in kindergarten, there were a lot of books that I liked to have read to me. Um, and there was one in particular that one day when I came home from school, and I'd heard this book recited a number of times, I wanted to show my mom and her friend how I could read. So here goes the kindergartner opening up the book, and page by page I was telling the story smoothly and like I knew it, and with a little emotion and everything. And my mom and her friend were sitting there amazed that I had learned to read it so early and so well. Until I continued with the story and started to ad lib even more. And then they figured out I actually memorized the story. It looked like I was reading, but it was a trick of memory. Now, that would have been amazing to see a kindergartner reading like that. Jesus, when he came to his hometown, amazed the people that knew him from the time he was little with the reputation of all that he had been doing at Capernaum, teaching and healing and doing miracles. And, and so now he comes to his hometown, and they're amazed at what they experience, but understand this was no trick of memorization. This was the real deal. What we learn at the very beginning of this whole thing is that the reason why there's this marked change in the life of Christ is being fully God yet fully man in his humanity the spirit came upon him and empowered him to do the deeds and share the words that he was doing throughout Capernaum and the people were being amazed by what they were seeing the big difference was the Spirit of God coming upon him and empowering him for ministry. Now understand that Christ, being fully God, could do that himself. But when he became a man, he set aside the independent use of his divine powers and attributes and submitted himself to the Father's will in his humanity. And that's why it was so important that the Spirit empowered him. And so he actually even sets for us an example of how we walk on this earth as human beings. As believers, we need the power of the Spirit. And so in verses 14 through 15, we see him begin his ministry in Galilee. It says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and re a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Now, if you remember, the Spirit anointed him at the baptism in chapter 3, verse 22. The Spirit filled him in chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted in chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit empowers Christ, we see in verse 14. This word power, dunamis, we got our word dynamite from this word, dynamite. Those of you who are older know what I'm talking about. But this word dunamis means being able or capable so in context here, specifically, the supernatural ability imparted by the Holy Spirit. That which the natural is unable to accomplish, the Spirit is able to accomplish. And so we talk about this as being the power of the Holy Spirit, doing supernatural things through here, the humanity of Christ, but also through us as human beings, God's people, who are baptized in the Spirit, have been empowered. And so Jesus begins his ministry. It's not only how Christ's ministry begins, but it's also how the church's ministry begins in the book of Acts. Being empowered by the Spirit. And actually, Jesus tells them, don't even try to start your ministry without it. In Acts 1, 4 through 5, it says, 
And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. And so he's talking to the disciples. This is after his resurrection, before he ascends into heaven. Don't leave Jerusalem, he says, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so it was about 10 days from the ascension at this point that then the Spirit came down at Pentecost and empowered the believers. And at that point, Peter preached the gospel and 3,000 were added to the number of the church and, and uh, the gospel spread like wildfire throughout the whole earth. And so Christ comes to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. No wonder amazing things are happening. And so this report goes around the surrounding country. Did you hear about the miracle worker? Did you hear about the prophet? And people were coming to find him and hoping to see him. It's thought that Christ had done this ministry for about a year before going to Nazareth. And so time enough for that reputation to build. And it says that he was being glorified by all. That word to be glorified is usually used for God, not man. It means to be worthy of praise and honor. And so Christ is being glorified. It's God's son. This is pretty powerful. And so the next thing we see is Jesus tries then to minister in his hometown. So his ministry is going amazing in the surrounding area, but now he comes to where he grew up. In verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And so... I can imagine him entering town and people recognizing him. Oh, hey, there's little Jesus. He's got a beard now. Man, look at that. And it's not just the little stragglers that my boys have to shave off. You know, it's the full-on 30-year-old style beard. Well, I don't know if that's full-on, but it's close. But this is a divine appointment. His arrival in his hometown is in accordance with God's leading in his life. He brings him to this place where, you know, it might not have been that exciting of a thought to be going back to his hometown. Maybe that's the way you feel about your hometown, um, where people know you, where you have a past. where there were presuppositions you're trying to escape about who you are and how people define you. But Jesus walks into his hometown and he goes to the synagogue, as was his custom. So Jesus was a consistent synagogue attender. So he would go every Saturday to synagogue. That was his custom. I mean, even though he's God, in the flesh, he still gathered with God's people consistently. During the great feast, he would travel all the way to Jerusalem and celebrate those feasts in accordance with God's word. Jesus was consistent in his worship, in his fellowship, and again, sets for us the example. Not only in his prayer life, not only in being empowered by the Spirit, but in those habits that are healthy, and good for us and our family to make a part of our lives. In Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, it says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Meeting together is so important. But I think, you know, when Christ entered the synagogue in Jerusalem, I mean, did he see perfect people? Did he see perfect gatherings? I think not. If he knew of the weaknesses of the people, um, 
much more than you would ever understand, but he still chose to gather with them. That's pretty cool. Even this morning, God chooses to gather with us, and there's that promise that Jesus is in our midst where two or three are gathered. And so his spirit moving in and among us, you know, you can imagine him walking up and down the hall, the aisles, and we're sitting next to one of you guys. But here's Jesus, and so he's in the synagogue, and he stands up to read. In verse 17, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And so he's, he's going to turn to a specific place we'll look at in just a second. But I want to talk about like what's going on right now in the synagogue service. If you're new to church, you know, you're watching everything going, what's going on now? Why is this happening? What does that mean? Um, and maybe you can even think of a time in your life where you've experienced that. As we're reading this, we're kind of in that situation. Imagine being in the synagogue, and now we're watching. Jesus stands up, and we're like thinking, okay, well, what's he going to do? Somebody hands him a scroll, like they already know what to do. Well, the synagogue itself originated during the time when Israel was exiled to Babylon. They formed synagogues, Whenever there were 10 Jewish males in any city or area, um, they were allowed to form a synagogue, and then it would be a place to worship and to hear God's word and study God's word. And so the procedure of the synagogue service went like this. There was a singing of a psalm. Sound familiar? The reading of the Shema, or uh, the reading of Scripture, specifically the Shema, is the hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so to be reminded of those first and most important things every week. Then they would read part of the law, which is the first five books of the Bible. They would read a reading section in Hebrew and then in Aramaic. It's kind of like this. If you grew up in a Catholic church when they used to speak Latin, some people understood Latin, but most of them, you know, today do not. So when the scriptures were read in Hebrew, this is really weird to think about, but a lot of the Jews didn't know Hebrew. But they knew Aramaic, so it was read in both. Hebrew, the original that it was written in, and then Aramaic, in which the majority of people would understand. So a reading from the law, and then they would choose a part of the prophets, which is the rest of the Old Testament in general, um, a little bit of each, both also the prophets in Hebrew and then Aramaic. And then somebody would give a sermon. And after teaching the scriptures, at the very end, there was a blessing by the synagogue ruler, and people would go on their way. So that was the service. So Jesus stands up to read. And a scroll's brought to him. Now, they would read the scriptures standing up, but they would sit and teach. It's kind of interesting. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. You know, you guys have in your hands your Bibles. You realize how amazing it is that I don't have to, like, give you a little sheet with the portion of scripture that we read? that you carry with you a whole Bible. They would have to go to synagogue to hear it because not, most people weren't rich enough to own a scroll. And so they had to go there. Um, the scroll is handed to Christ and, and he reads it. And this is the way it would go. Men would take turns reading and expounding on passages. And if there was a special guest or a well-known teacher, they would be asked to teach. And so Jesus here was the special guest. Come home to his hometown, and they were all excited to hear him preach. And so he rolls the scroll over to Isaiah 61, which describes the Messiah's ministry. 
And so in verse 18, we see the quotation. And he's reading, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These verses are very important, and I believe that they were on the forefront of Jesus' mind during his first advent or his first coming. Uh, His second advent or second coming is when he returns, but up to the time he ascended into heaven, that first coming, he kept these verses in the forefront of his mind, I believe, because we also see him quote these verses again in the book of Luke. When you see something repeated in the Bible, usually it's very important because there's so many things that can be said throughout Scripture, but to repeat something emphasizes how it was probably more than just twice that Christ had these thoughts going through his head in these scriptures being recited. The other time it happens is when John the Baptist is in prison and he's starting to doubt a little bit. He's facing his own death and he sends somebody to Jesus to ask him if he was the one that we were waiting for, the Messiah. Now instead of getting down on John, And Jesus saying, come on, John, you should know this. He sends a message. And the message are the words that he just read. Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. The words of the messianic mission. Why are these so important? Well, if you notice, if you actually turn to Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, You'll see as you read through all the way to the end of verse 2, and we'll have it on the screen here, it says towards the end, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, but Jesus leaves out the next line, and the day of vengeance of our God. (laughs) He doesn't say that when he's reading in the synagogue, and he doesn't say it when he sends the message to John. Why? Well, it's because that last line, the day of vengeance, is the second coming of Christ. So that means the words beforehand, he purposefully and intentionally kept it on the front of his mind and intentionally left the last part off because he was proclaiming his identity as Messiah, the anointed one, and his mission, what he came to do. So that people would recognize it. And so here we have Jesus' own statement of his identity and mission. I have a quote from a New American commentary. This is very interesting. The author, Robert Stein, pulls out this insight. He says, we already have had such a reliable witness as a devout priest and his wife. Talking about who Jesus is so far in the book of Luke. The angel Gabriel, the angel of the Lord, the righteous Simeon, remember the prophet in the temple that proclaimed who Jesus was, and prophets such as Anna and John the Baptist that said, Behold, the Lamb of God, when he baptized Christ and to Jesus' person and role. Now, however, Jesus himself answered the question, Who is this one? He knew exactly who he was and what he came to do, and he kept that on the forefront of his mind, and he had this life verse, if you will, this verse for this season in his life to keep on the forefront of his mind. So useful at times to have those verses in our minds that keep us on track. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But the the role that he has, first he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so now he's talking about the Holy Spirit again. And to Luke, this is really important. 
Christ is anointed and he's empowered and he's doing this ministry. And then to Luke, it's very important. Christians understand the transition in Acts, which he also wrote, to then the Spirit coming upon his people to preach the gospel. And we see a similar ministry, proclaiming good news to the poor. The poor are not just the economically poor, but it also speaks of the outcasts, those who are not normal synagogue attenders or even lost sheep. The good news to the poor, the poor also means the humble, poor in spirit, those in touch with their own deep spiritual need because they understand that they're sinners like the tax collector that beat his chest as he prayed before the Lord, saying, woe is me, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm unclean. Jesus comes to preach good news to those folks. The prideful won't listen, but he's come for them. It's their time. The prideful, self-righteous had their time, but now it's the time for those who are humble and willing to accept Jesus Christ. It wasn't the poor that rejected Jesus. And so the reality is we're all spiritually poor. We're all helpless. We're all in need of salvation. If you've accepted Christ, then you are the poor this good news is for. He's come to proclaim liberty to the captives. This word liberty always refers to, throughout the scriptures, forgiveness forgiveness of sins. Throughout all of Luke's writing in Luke and Acts, liberty, forgiveness of sins, liberation from sin and its consequences. And then also he's proclaiming recovery of sight to the blind, so literally he's healing blind people, but also he's removing our spiritual blindness. When we could not see the light of the glory of the gospel, God's power opened our eyes so that we could see and understand. You set at liberty those who are oppressed, and we also see this casting out of demons as part of Jesus' ministry. Proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. This is an allusion to the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament that Every 50 years, slaves were freed, debts were forgiven, and land was returned to its rightful families. What a cool thing to have in society. Don't you wish we had a reset button in our society? Debts forgiven, family land given back, and what a blessing it would be. But the year of the Lord's favor is an allusion to the year of Jubilee, which happened every 50 years, but it also points to the kingdom of God. If God was running things on this earth with man submitted to his rule, what would it look like? It would look amazing. The year of the Lord's favor is not a literal year, but a time when God's grace brings freedom, forgiveness, and healing It's a synonym for the good news of the kingdom of God. Pretty cool. So, in verse 20, after we read it, it says, And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and then he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. I mean, can you imagine if somebody in our church got up and read um, these verses, and then... Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've come to heal. I've come to preach. And you'd be like, he's really sounding like he's saying that about himself. Is he really saying that about himself or is he reading it as if God's saying it? I'm not quite sure. So everybody's looking at him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I wonder if there was like gasps. Excitement, some and others, like, how dare he say such a thing? And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. You know, 
If it's true, oh, how great this would be. And so, Jesus tells us at another time in Scripture, beware when all men speak well of you, for so they did the false prophets. This speaking well of Christ only lasts a verse. (laughs) And then it turns sour pretty quick. And that's the third thing we see. Jesus is rejected by those most familiar with him. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? This is where things turn for the worse. They're like amazed and then they realize, wait a second now, I knew this, I changed this kid's diapers. I saw him get zits for the first time, you know. Um, And here he is, proclaiming to be the Messiah. Isn't this Joseph's son? I mean, who we all know. We've known Joseph. Everyone in Nazareth was familiar with Jesus, but they didn't truly know Jesus. You might think, how is it possible to know about Jesus but not know him at all? If you have a watch... On, cover it up. Don't look at it. Do you truly know your watch? Here's something to think about. Are there numbers or slashes on your watch or both? Are there any other writings on the face of your watch other than numbers? If so, what does it say? Is there a second hand or not? What surrounds the face of your watch? Or what does the band look like? What brand is your watch? Okay, now take a look. Were you right? There are a lot of things in our lives that we are around all the time, but when it comes to the details of those things, we don't know as much as we thought we did. So here's these people, they see Jesus every day, but they don't really know him, that he is the Son of God. They don't know his origin, that he was sent from the Father from heaven. And they're not willing to accept it. In verse 23, and he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And so Jesus brings up this proverb that was well known. Actually, it was really well known in not only the Jewish world, but also the Greek world. The Greek writings uh, said this, A physician for others, but himself teeming with sores. Jewish writings said this, Physician, physician, heal thine own limb. And so we see this kind of phrasing in writings of the day and in before this day, and it was common, it was a common phrasing. And so Jesus goes, I know you guys, and I know you're going to use this against me. I know that you guys are going to ask me to do the miracles I was doing everywhere else, but parallel accounts and other Gospels tell us that Jesus was not able to do many miracles in Nazareth because of their lack of faith. It's because they didn't truly believe he was God's son. All they could think about is, isn't this Joseph's son? And so they didn't truly know Christ. In verse 24, and he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Uh, So Mark expands on this whole idea of the hometown prophet. In Mark 6, 4, it says, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. My brother's a police officer, and I'm really proud of him. He's really done well, and um, 
if, though, I was driving down the street and I got pulled over and then I saw my brother walking up to my window, I'd be like, oh, dude, it's my brother. It's my bro. And I might be tempted to belittle his office as a police officer and just, oh, man, why'd you pull me over? And uh, joke around and stuff. Because that's the way it is when we know somebody so well. I mean, normally we might be intimidated or some people might be tempted to cry when they get pulled over. I never would. My wife does when I get pulled over, but no, I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm like, keep it up, keep it up. No, but that belittling the heavenly office of Christ with their earthly relationship. That can happen. It did happen to Jesus. It could happen to you. When God calls you to do something, when he has gifted you with something, a message to preach or a spiritual gift to use, that those closest to you could belittle those things. Or even you yourself could belittle yourself. We take the earthly relationships and what's known in that realm and we impose it upon the person that we see before us rather than acknowledging the heavenly office or the heavenly gifting that the Spirit empowers them with. So, Just as the Old Testament prophets were rejected by Israel, Jesus was rejected in his hometown. Bummer. And so, the thought of him being rejected by his own, he then says something that doesn't go over very well. He talks about, though they reject him, he will turn his attention to those least expected to believe in him, in verse 25. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel, In the time of the prophet Elisha, none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So what Jesus does is he gives Old Testament examples of how these prophets that were rejected went to Gentile areas and did miracles. And God's grace was poured out on them because of their faith. Nazareth is a picture of how Israel as a nation responded to Jesus. John 1.11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so God's plan is to, though Christ his son rejected in Israel, that the message of the gospel will go out to the Gentiles. But there is an order to ministry, and we see it not only the way Christ is reaching to Israel first, but also the apostles, and especially Paul. He even talks about this, that he goes first to the synagogues, and then he goes to the Gentiles, if the synagogues reject him. And so, first to the Jew, but then to the Gentile. In Romans 1.16, it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone, Jew and Gentile, who believes. First for the Jew and also to the Greek. Christ was of the people of Israel and went to Israel and didn't travel very far in his ministry. Very small area. But then the apostles were sent out to the dispersed tribes of Israel and then to the Gentiles. And so God's plan was carried out. But the people didn't want to hear it because they had a hard time with Gentiles. Here's some of the strong views against Gentiles that Jews had in those days. 
first. They would say Gentiles were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. Wow. Uh, another one. God loves only Israel out of all the nations he's made. Or again, the best of serpents crushed and the best of Gentiles killed. Now these aren't scripture, mind you, but they were quotes from those who were bigoted against non-Jews. It was not lawful in the Jewish world to help a Gentile woman give birth because that would be bringing another Gentile into the world. If a Jew married a Gentile, the family would hold a funeral for that Jew that was marrying the Gentile. So this is pretty serious stuff. Jesus steps on a sacred cow and ticks a lot of people off. And so... With an attitude like Jonah toward the Ninevites, they respond by saying, no way. The book of Jonah is really fun to read. It's, it's an amazing story, but at the end, it's just so unthinkable. I can't even imagine God spares Nineveh, but Jonah sets up in a, a vantage place where he can see the city, and he waits for Nineveh to be destroyed anyway. And when God spares him, Jonah is mad. Jonah wanted to see some hellfire and brimstone come down upon his enemies, but God forgave them instead. It was that same attitude that was in Nazareth when Jesus spoke about their rejection and the Gentiles accepting. And that's why Nazareth became so furious. Hearing about God's grace going to those who don't deserve it. How dare God do such a thing, they thought. But isn't that what grace is? God's goodness to those who don't deserve it? And so we carry on that same heart. We reach out to the lost. In Luke 19, 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's the sick that need a doctor, not the healthy. He went to sinners. He came for druggies. He came for politicians. He came for movie stars. He came for atheists. He came for Muslims. He came for North Koreans. He came for tribal people in Papua New Guinea. He came for the whole world. Is there anybody in your mind that you've put into a separate section like the Nazareth, Nazareth people in Nazareth did? saying, no, not the Gentiles, anybody but them. In your mind, who you set aside and say, God, just save everybody but not them. That's not God's heart. And I think God will take you under his arm and say, come here, son, or come here, daughter, let me, let me teach you something. Remember where you came from. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But notice the switch. And such were some of you. <laughs> That's where you came from. The worst of the worst. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It was God's grace. And so we should long for God's grace in other people's lives as well. In verse 28, their wrath, their anger culminates in a desire to kill. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, so that they can throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Talk about a sermon going bad. I have nightmares of sermons going bad. Whether I get up here and, and you know, I'm in my underwear, or <laughs> I get up here and then I'm like, what am I doing up here? I don't have a sermon to preach. And everybody's looking at me and they start leaving and stuff. You know, sermons going bad, not a good thought. 
But Christ's sermon goes bad, but he said the truth. He taught the right thing. And so the people, they take him to the brow of the hill because they were ready to kill him. Notice the parallel to the cross. Out of the city, or out of the town, up to a hill to put him to death. But it wasn't time yet. It wasn't time yet. It's similar, but it's, this isn't it. God still has plan, but time is limited. This is kind of like a foretaste reminder. The end's coming. Time is limited. Maybe two years left, three years of ministry. And so they take him to the brow of the hill because oftentimes when people were stoned to death, they were first thrown off a cliff. Kind of helps in the process, I guess. And then stoned probably what they were planning on doing. But Jesus passes through their midst. I personally feel like this was a miraculous event because it was not time yet. And so against the natural flow of man's will, God supernaturally preserves Christ's time on earth for that culminating hatred of the world at the time of the cross. Those that knew him best were the first to want to kill him. Isn't that crazy? And that as the world became more familiar with him, the world wanted to kill him. Christ is very polarizing. The more you know him, you either love him or you hate him. There is no middle ground. But... When it comes to our life, I want to think of these three thoughts in applying what we learn today in our lives. Um, the application, living a life that makes a difference for Jesus. You know, we see the early church walk in the footsteps of Jesus' ministry. The same example he said they followed, and we are called to do the same. And so I think that first step just as it was in the book of Acts, if you want to live a life that makes a difference, you know, by serving God, reaching out to the lost, serving in ministry, number one, you need a life empowered by the Spirit. Life empowered by the Spirit. One of the reasons why this is so important is because people will try to define you and even you will put yourself in a box and people will ask, like in my life, isn't that little Dale? Because that's what my family called me growing up. My dad's name is Dale. I'm Dale. It's little Dale. And even though I'm the biggest guy now, uh, they still call me little Dale. Isn't that little Dale up there preaching? Talk about being put in a box. Man. Now, I don't struggle with it at all. I can think it's endearing, but uh, I could easily go, oh, they're calling me Little Dale. <laughs> you know? You might do that to yourself, or people might be doing that to you. And so you, like, shy away from ministry. But what do we see Christ do? We see, instead of shying away, because he's empowered by the Spirit, he's emboldened to preach the truth, and to walk in accordance with the Father's will, no matter how people respond. And we see the power in his ministry throughout the rest of this book. And so you are called to rely upon the power of the Spirit. And it breaks you free from all of those boxes that people have put you in. And maybe you're not serving in the church because you're in this box and you're scared or you're afraid of what other people will think of you. And God is like, what are you waiting for? I already told you. I've given you my spirit. 
you are just the sidekick and he is the superhero. All you got to do is walk with him and you're going to see some awesome stuff. Be empowered by the Spirit. And it's in that you'll also see the effective ministry through your spiritual gifts in the church, but also as you share Christ with the world. In Acts 1.8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's where the power of witnessing comes from, not coming up with some really well-thought-out arguments. Whenever I've done that and I've been sharing with people, they always derail the argument. I don't know if you guys have been in that place, but you can just get into an argument. But when you rely upon the power of the Spirit, I would say weird things happen, but it's more than weird. They're wonderful things happen where people ask you, what must I do to be saved? Pray for those that are lost around you and see what God might do. When you see the power of the Spirit working, it's undeniable. Secondly, life inspired by Scripture. Jesus had those verses on the forefront of his mind and he shared them with John and he shared them with his hometown. He kept his mission straight and his identity clear. Is there a verse God has put on your heart for maybe this season in life that you're in? To keep your mission clear. To keep your identity strong in Jesus. Um, Paul had a verse like this. In Acts 20, 24, it said... But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's an awesome life verse. When I was first a Christian and I was experiencing the initial losing of popularity and friends and things like that. God gave me this as my life verse. In Philippians 3, 7 through 8, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. And through high school and college, that kept me walking on the path and kept me going straight, kept my vision and mission clear. What might it be for you? Pray the Lord to show you that verse. Write it down. Memorize it. Keep it in the forefront. Not that you forsake the rest of Scripture, but that you keep something in your pocket, ready to go for when you're being tempted or tried or you're confused or somebody stuck you in a box. You can get right back out. But then lastly, have a life invested wisely. If you want to live a life that makes a difference. Now that was a close call on the brow of the hill for Jesus. God saved him from it. Those who knew him best try to kill him first. But we know from that it's only a matter of time before he'd be crucified in Jerusalem. Have you had a wake-up call before (laughs) that makes you go, oh, dang, my time is limited. Now, we talked about that in Hawaii just a couple weeks ago when they got that incoming missile. This is not a drill. I mean, my daughter and all of her Bible college friends thought they were going to die. And they're in the middle of worship service, so they said, let's just keep worshiping. (laughs) Cool way to enter heaven, right? Maybe you've gotten or received bad 
medical news before. And it opens your eyes. You only have so much time on this earth. And we only have so much time before Christ returns. Don't waste it. We're left on earth with a mission. And that is to make disciples of all nations. And so, as it says in Ephesians 15 through 17, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Choose to walk that path that is empowered by the Spirit, inspired by the Scriptures, and in line with the mission that God has called you to. What's your spiritual bucket list? If you were to think, not, not the fun things I'd want to do before I die, like jumping off of a um, cliff with a bungee cord or something, but the amazing things of sharing Christ with somebody. In praying for them to receive Jesus. I just want to lead one person to Jesus at least. Or I want to go on a mission trip. Or I want to minister to the poor. 